Hey, Milkweed Nation. Welcome back to Grow Milkweed Plants podcast. My name is Brad Graham. I'm the host. And on our last episode, which was way back in March of 2021, we had a National Plant of Flower Day. And uh, we talked about uh, the Monarch Sanctuary Project down there in uh, central Texas in the Austin area. And it's going to be interesting to go back and take a look at some of the projects that were being done down there. There was a Monarch Way Station, and I purchased, uh, I believe it was three flats of plants, just uh, under 300 plants from Monarch Watch that were grown at a local nursery through the um, Milkweed Market program that chip taylor started uh it was really good quality plants and uh man we planted we planted a lot of them down there uh but some time has passed and uh things have changed in a new location podcasting from milkweed headquarters in salt lake city utah area just north of salt lake in layton and this is the new studio for Grow Milkweed Plants. So thanks for joining me. If you subscribe to the show uh, in the past and you're, you're just getting this feed again in 2023, welcome back. The show is still active, even if I took uh, almost two years off. So we are back. Um, something else that's back is the Monarch Butterfly. In the last uh, month, I went down to California and went to an event called International Western Monarch Summit 2023. So that was held in San Luis Obispo on January 20th, 21st, and 22nd of uh this year, 2023. It was a pretty cool event. Um, there was a ton of information that was shared. Um, if you are deep down the rabbit hole of monarch butterflies, um, just the, you know, just the ecosystem in general, whether it's your local or state, uh, national ecosystems, uh, things don't stop at the borders, but a lot of uh, funding definitely does. Uh, but there were a lot of state agencies and federal agencies participating, including um, tribal leaders. And that was really wonderful. I took notes on 14 different speakers that attended the Western Monarch Summit. And the main reason I did this is because I knew I was going to have a terrible memory about, you know, regurgitating all this in-depth information that they've taken their life studying. Um, so rather than, uh, rather than, you know, try to remember it, which was going to be futile because there was just so much information during the event. Uh, I took, uh, just brief notes. So on January 20th, which was the first day of the event, the first speaker was Dr. David James. Uh, Dr. David James from Washington State University. He was one of the first people I contacted when I got uh, into uh, monarch butterflies. Basically, I had spent 2014 trying to attract monarchs by growing milkweed. And because it was successful almost immediately, um, I had myself my first monarch. And, you know, as one does, I named the monarch. Um, people like to do that kind of stuff. It's, it's a little bit weird. Uh, the monarch's name was Andy. Not sure why I remember that. I mean, it was almost a decade ago. But... Andy was my first monarch, and I thought to myself, where the heck is this butterfly going to go? And 
I emailed David James and I said, uh, I see you have a Monarch tagging program. I was wondering if I could get some of your tags. He sent me one or two sheets of WSU tags. And I, man, I stuck one. I don't know if I stuck one on Andy. I probably didn't have them at the time, but the following year I still had the tags and I used them. And I, I tagged, I don't know, maybe 13 Monarchs or something in my second year. And it felt good to participate in this program. But that was 2014, 2015. So now it's 2023. And Dr. James did a talk at the Western Monarch Summit. The title of his talk was Back from the Dead. And he was talking about how monarchs had gone from 2000 as their count uh, two years ago to over 300,000 monarchs. Wow, that's a substantial increase in monarchs. So again, I'll just repeat that. Um, in 2021, in the 2020 slash 2021 count, there was 2,000 monarchs. Uh, they were called functionally extinct at the time at least the migration, not the species, because they have a worldwide distribution, but the Western migration, which is specific to what we're talking about. The Western migration went from 2,000 monarchs to over 300,000 monarchs. And I'll give you the Thanksgiving count total for the 2022 2023 Thanksgiving count. So the Thanksgiving count is the first of two counts. And the Thanksgiving count had a total of 335,479 butterflies during the study's Thanksgiving count period. That is um, just about the highest population of monarchs in a uh, in about the last 10 years approximately so i mean how did they go from 2000 to over 335,000 monarchs well that's a great question so before we get into that um there's a normal decline between the uh, november count and the january count and uh, Dr. James said that the normal decline from the Thanksgiving count to the New Year's count is 40%. Now, if there was a 40% decline this year, it would have brought the population down to just over 200,000 going into 2023. However, the 2022 to 2023 decline was about 52%. So a larger decline due to storms, possibly. There's a question mark at the end of that. So 52% is substantially more monarchs just disappearing, at least in the wintering sites during the count, than a normal year. That's 12% more just vanished between Thanksgiving count and the Christmas count. So not positive why. And... Um, not seeing mass mortality at the wintering sites. Maybe they flew away. So if there's not mass mortality at the wintering sites, say you're not seeing a, a bunch of uh, deceased monarchs, uh, there is a chance that they, they just flew away. So um, with a 52% decline from the 330 plus thousand monarchs, that leaves us with um, the New Year's count being close to 161,000 monarchs. So even though we had a great Thanksgiving count, um, it's really questionable because the Christmas or the New Year's count was substantially lower, 161,000. So that 52% decline. Um, I, I guess I'll just add my two cents that I think there's a good chance that they did fly away. They just weren't in those wintering 
wintering sites. They just went somewhere else. Uh, so Dr. James uh, says that neonicotinoids are the number one most widely used herbicide. He also says that there's an association to the rise in use of neonics and the decline in monarchs. I'll just leave it at that. He also said, I think we are seeing a second DDT type era with neonicotinoids. Uh, that, when he said that, that was, um, that was a powerful way to start the, the conference. I mean, I, I'll say it again. I think we are seeing a second DDT type era with neonicotinoids. Some people listening to this podcast might not be real familiar with DDT. Um, but, um, I was, I was just like a middle schooler in 1997 when I saw a quarter million monarchs in one overwintering site, natural bridges in Santa Cruz. And just about that same time, my sister was doing a science project and reporting on the effects of DDT in the environment. And I didn't, I didn't follow, I mean, I was a middle schooler. I didn't follow her science project too closely, but I remember there was some scary shit in her science project and DDT, DDT was a mess. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Uh, Dr. James says the fall 2020, uh, in the fall of 2020, none of the Pacific Northwest tagged monarchs were seen in any overwintering sites. They were mostly in San Francisco gardens, and the sightings of monarchs were mostly associated with milkweed. This followed the first Pacific Northwest migrant found in 2018 breeding in Los Angeles on milkweed. He says that there was a low population in 2020 and that correlated with new winter breeding of Western monarchs. So just to break that down for you, Basically, there was almost no monarchs and their behavior kind of was different. So the monarchs were not just chilling out uh, in trees and waiting for spring. Um, they were mostly all searching out um, what milkweed they could find. And they just continued breeding. I mean, they, they did migrate because Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area are both, they're both warm enough. They're not, they're not really tropical, but they're warm enough to, to breed if they, if they wanted to, if they needed to. Um, he says that um, will winter reproduction be the end of the Western migration? No, exclamation point said in an Australian accent. Okay, let, let me say that again. Will winter reproduction be the end of Western migration? No. Anyway, basically like the fact that monarchs were breeding in the winter, that really seems to like upset entomologists because... Uh, not a specific entomologist. I'm, I'm just saying in general, my take on this is that they look at the uh, monarch diapause schedule and when they see them not in diapause in the winter, um, they just, they think that can't exist. And that's simply not my observation. And it wasn't David James' observation in uh, 2020. So we're 28,000 missing monarchs actually inland in California in 2020 through 2021 when it was hot 
be on the lookout. So what he was, uh, what he was asking for was help finding new overwintering locations. So the weather in the winter, uh, December, 2020 going into January of 2021 was above average. Um, from San Francisco down to Los Angeles, the coastal areas saw warmer temperatures. So were the monarchs uh, active? Were they breeding, reproducing? Were they simply looking for colder places? Like were they in different trees? There's a lot of trees in California. I don't know the answer to that. Nobody does. But if you're out hiking in California and you see monarchs roosting, come sundown hey report that that'd be good information to know need more data okay so fall temps in california in september and october influence monarch winter population every year high temps are negative so if the temperatures are if the temperature is 75 degrees um, that's that's a negative impact on the population. 72 degrees and lower is much better. So these subtle differences in the temperature during September and October greatly influence the winter population. Uh, there's a program that I'm going to look for more information on, which is something that he participated in his local area, and it's called Vineyard beauty with benefits program and it seeks out to increase uh, pollinator plots in uh, vineyards uh, basically at wineries where they're growing the uh, grapes on the vines having a pollinator plot in your vineyard brings beauty and has benefits not only to the pollinators but to the wine grapes themselves so that sounds like an awesome program if you have a winery and you're looking for information on how to enhance the property contact david james about the vineyard beauty with benefits program all right david says that more fall flowering plants in california near wintering sites directly adds lipid mass to monarchs so what that means is when the monarchs get to their wintering sites, their tanks may not be full. And if there's flowers with nectar right near where they're going to be wintering, that it will have a big impact, a big positive impact on the winter weight. And the winter weight of the monarch determines the success of survival through the winter months because they're usually not feeding, so they rely on their fat stores. We call the fat lipids. There's uh, four Ps that impact mortality. Predators, parasitoids, pathogens, and parasites. Dr. James points out that pathogens do not eradicate their host. And uh, these, uh, let's see, I made a note, 1% to 3% mortality. So I'm not positive what that note relates to, if it's all of those combined or not. I feel like that would be higher. But pathogens do not eradicate their host. So predators, yeah, there's a predator. They're pretty much, they're pretty much killing the monarch. If there's parasitoids, uh, same thing. Parasitoids, like a par parasitic, I think that would be a parasitic wasp or fly. And then the pathogens, they don't uh, eradicate their host. So a pathogen would be OE. Uh, OE is a pathogen that lives on the monarch. Uh, doesn't entirely kill them. So that's super interesting. I'm going to take a short break. And when we come back, I'll give you a heads up of what to expect in future episodes.
All right, welcome back. Um, on the next episode, I'm going to talk about um, the things that were said at the conference by Dr. Myron Zalucki. Uh, Dr. Myron Zalucki is uh, from University of Queensland, and he did a talk on Will Monarchs Go Extinct? So that's going to be on episode 52. Um, just to transition to some of the things that I've been doing in my local um, habitats around here in Salt Lake City area. Uh, recently ad adopted a kind of a, an abandoned truck stop or something like that. I don't know. I It's like a, I call it the ghost garden. So you might see some posts on Instagram or whatever. The ghost garden is basically an off-ramp and an on-ramp that just happens to be along my commute that appears to be like a disheveled rest stop. Like the building has been removed. There's no trash trash service at this area. So even though there's like a 50-gallon barrel full of garbage, uh, there's nobody servicing it. Uh, why do I bring this up? Well, I said I adopted it, which basically just means like I stop there on my drive. Like I haven't formally adopted it through a program, but that's basically how I do most of my milkweed planting. I just go out and do it. You don't need permission to do it. Um, so what I, what I started doing is I started collecting trash, picking up rubbish, and sowing milkweed seeds. So February right now, it's extremely cold. Uh, we've had temperatures in January down to, uh, I don't know, I think I observed like three degrees at my house, three degrees Fahrenheit. So super cold, great time to winter sow your milkweed. Um, I'm using locally collected showy milkweed. It's available on the website at growmilkweedplants.com. And I'm just uh, sowing those seeds using a little hand rake and uh, picking up trash and in its place, dropping some milkweed seed. So we'll give you an update on that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time. When you sow milkweed seeds, it's not a... I mean, I'm not sowing tropical milkweed seeds. I'm sowing the locally native showy milkweed seeds. Literally almost invisible in its first year. Just blends in with the grass. And then in its second year, if it has a nice root, which it usually will, you're going to have a really nice, nice leafy green showy milkweed plant. So the ghost garden, that's one project. Um, I've also been uh, planting um, a variety of milkweeds at a little plot in front of my office, uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, well, we're just not going to tell you exactly where that is because, well, for, for certain reasons. But I uh, put some butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. I also put uh, Mexican world milkweed, Asclepius fascicularis. Put the local uh, native showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa. And I seeded a lot of speciosa in the area as well. Also uh, tuberosa seeds in the same area. Um, those, were, those were already rooted plants. I started them with uh, germination. I water germinated them. And then as soon as they germinated, I put them into a jar for germination. I don't know if I've gone over germination on this podcast because uh, I just kind of developed it as a process, um, piggybacking off of uh, a product that my wife actually got me for my birthday. She got me a, a lavender plant in a jar from a nonprofit in Oakland, California called uh, Back to Roots, Back to the Roots. I think it's Back to, Back to the Roots. And they, uh, they just had a giant jar, like a giant pickle jar full of dirt. And they're just like, yeah, just throw the seeds in top, add a little bit of water, and then like close the lid until it germinates and then pull the top off. So I totally copied their idea. And I mean, it's not really unique, but it's extremely successful for starting pretty much every kind of milkweed. And then as soon as they start growing, get a couple pairs of leaves on them. They can't live inside the jar forever. That's not really practical. But the point is it's super easy to just pull them out, dig a very small hole using like if you have a half pint jar, you don't have to dig a very big hole. 
you just drop it in the ground. So that's what I did. And I did it in the fall as far as like when I planted them. So they went through a natural dormancy after growing. And I'm looking forward to next year. They should be pretty big plants. So that's uh, at my office at work. Uh, what other projects do I have? Um, I've got a got a lot of seeds available. So again, growmilkweedplants.com slash store. You're going to see all the seeds that are available. Um, just about to drop uh, some more Asclepius Texana seeds that uh, David B. collected in 2018. Asclepius Texana, super important, super isolated population of plants. I think I said there were like 13 counties in Texas. Um, the majority of those counties are just west of Interstate 35 in the Austin, Texas area. And then there's like another population like a little ways south and then west, um, like in the southwest part of Texas and Asclepius Texana. So I don't have very many of those seeds, so they're kind of priced accordingly, but uh, su super cool plant. Um. Yeah, so we're just going to leave it at that since this is the first uh, podcast episode since uh, returning after quite a while. And when we come back, we're going to talk about um, what uh, the speaker, Dr. Myron Zalucki, had to say about uh, monarch butterflies and their possible extinction. Thanks for joining me at Grow Milkweed Plants. <laughs>